uh, welcome to the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Sheila Domkaler, and I'm one of the partners. Um, I'm wor I work with for one of the partners of the Comptic Valley Memorial Association in um, bringing this, uh, the Crossroads exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America, to Turner's Falls and Franklin County. Um, PVMA, Pocumptic Valley Memorial Association, has worked with the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage for decades now, I think. Where's Jim over there? Um, and it's been a really wonderful partnership um, for both organizations. Um, so we were really happy to, um, re we reached out to see if they would be interested in and helping us with the programming for Crossroads, and Jim uh, signed on. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting in for, maybe. But uh, um, So let's see, I just want to make sure I, I thank all the people involved in, in this program and the Crossroads program. Uh, I want to thank um, John Boschman from Frontier Community Access TV, who's filming this today. So thank you to Jim and to John and and then to our two presenters. Um, so Crossroads Change in Rural America was brought to the Great Falls Discovery Center in Turner's Falls through a collaboration between the Smithsonian's Museum on Main Street and Mass Humanities. So this and other Crossroads companion events, this one here today, have been produced by the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation, which manages the, the park in Turner's Falls, Friends of the Great Falls Discovery Center, River Culture, Pocumptic Valley Memorial Association, or PVMA, Montague Public Libraries, and New England Public Media. Um, additional support has come from Mass Cultural Council's local councils um, for our, our final Shea program, and I'm gonna list them. It's amazing how much support we got. Bernardson, Buckland, Charlemont Holly, Colrain, Conway, Irving, Gill, Leverett, Leiden, New Salem, Northfield, Orange, Rowe, Shutesbury, and Waitley. So that was a really wonderful response we got from, from all these towns in Franklin County. Uh, partners for the statewide tour were one of six locations that the Crossroads exhibit has come to or is coming to in Massachusetts this year. Um, they include the National Endowment for the Humanities, Big Y, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. The local business sponsor is Greenfield Savings Bank. So, um, yeah, so, so enjoy the talk today. Thank you all for coming. So, and Steve Smithers. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I guess I will continue my introduction to, uh, to fill in the blanks, but uh, I'm from Asheville. My name is Steve Smithers. I'm a silversmith, a brass smith, copper smith, Pewter, tin, iron, platinum, gold. Um, I've delved in all of it um, my whole life. I grew up in Shelburne Falls, so um, this, is, this is home territory. Um, and it's nice to be uh, on, on a site, a historic site. I, I've done a, a number of talks and demonstrations at museums around um, the Northeast, but it's a museum. It's not a, uh, a historic site such as this, and so it's it's kind of interesting background to uh, for for what we're going to talk about here. Um, so I, I I grew up in Shelburne Falls, and um, I I went to to school. Um, I grew up on the Deerfield River, so in, incidentally, so right on the Deerfield River. So that's another sort of little connection. Um, I, I remember one of my first introductions to history was going to the uh, Memorial Hall Museum, 1959 or so, like that, and with the what, fourth grade. Yeah. Um, a class, and, and it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty interesting. I, little did I know that I would end up after college uh, in Boston um, making this sort of thing my, my, uh, my career. Um, but I, um, I, once I came back, three years in Boston was <coughs> It was a lot of fun, but 
um, early 60s, late, I mean, late 60s, early 70s, but it, I was not a city boy, so came back to Franklin County and started working in industry. Um, uh, Lampson and Goodnow, I did some time there, and I say did some time. <laughs> I, had, I was running a, a, a grinding machine, um, grinding basic knife blades, you know, in a big long room. I swear it was right out of the eight, late 1800s, you know, a big long room with machines, belt, all belt driven, with a canal of water for all the slurry and coolant to go down. And a, I had the introductory job, and so the big turbine was over my head. All the wheel, all the machines flap, 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 and so anyway, I did that. Um, I also worked at Greenfield Components, which is, which was by um, the Rotary. Um, then it was Brickers, and then it's um, Hotel. Um, and Miller's Falls Tool. I worked there, f setting up machine and operating. Um, so I got my my. Um, taste of, of uh, production work, machine, uh, modern um, uh, technology. And then from there, I proceeded to go backwards. Um, the last place I worked was uh, Bernard Plating Works, for someone else, rather, was Bernard Plating Works in Florence, where we um, uh, repaired and, and polished and replated um, rewired, you know, all, all these things, Hi household uh, metal objects. And I, I thought, well, this is kind of interesting, and especially when you understood there's history behind all of these pieces, and the makers, particularly in silver and silver plate, you know, they always sign their work. And you might even see an engraving on it, um, these pieces. So. There's a lot of story, a lot of information in, in, in many of these pieces. I found that very interesting. So, um, so I eventually opened up a, a little shop of my own in, in 79 uh, in Shelburne Falls, um, right by the Bridge of Flowers. And then um, I guess the rest is history. People started bringing... Uh, individuals, antique dealers, collectors, they'd bring all the different metals that I mentioned um, to repair or replate or, re, you know, um, repolish, rewire lamps. Um, and, you know, can you do this? It's, and it's always, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> a young guy with a couple of kids and, you know, on his own. So I'm not going to say no. So a job was a job. So there was quite a learning curve all along, but I certainly learned a lot of different things along the, the way. And now it's, what, uh, 44 years later, and I'm still doing the same thing. <laughs> and, and, and it's very satisfying and enjoyable. Um, so, um, and needless to say, my... My area of exp expertise is um, low-tech, 18th century technology and before, hammers and hand tools and s such. Um, so, you know, I forgot my teleprompter, so this is my <laughs> teleprompter, but um, uh, I, will, I do have some images I'll put on the screen. I think I can handle that. Um, Jim showed me how this works. He may have to show me again. <laughs> uh, so I know last week Jim talked about uh, industry in 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 uh, Franklin County and and beyond, and so I probably won't be talking too much about what he did, more about the individuals who started, who first came to this area, 
and how they all interconnected and uh, their, their sons and whatnot begat the whole uh, industry of metalworking industries of, of, uh, of this area. And uh, it's really quite an interesting, interesting, uh, oh yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah. Um, so the first influx of, of native people, you know, were non-native people rather, came up the rivers. And so, you know, the small mills, um, that grew up in the small villages on the rivers, you know, is basically how more than coming west, the first in, um, civilization occurred coming up to Connecticut. You know, obviously every town all the way from Springfield to, uh, to Hadley, of course, very early towns, Deerfield. Um, and uh, and so, so those... And they were farms mostly, so you always needed a blacksmith, and you needed a mason, and you needed a carpenter. So you know it's really about the individuals who who did this work, and um, you know in all those new towns. And I'm particularly um, involved with and have been involved with Deerfield for for going way back to what is it 1959 where it all started in a way um, and so I, a lot of my f uh, focus will be on Deerfield although obviously the smaller towns um, Conway, Coleraine, Kendall Mills, Shelburne Falls, Lampson and Goodnow, you know, all these um, small towns all had their first little sawmills in, and um, pretty every town had a little sawmill or a grist mill or something on a stream. And, um, and as, as these villages developed, obviously, there was a need for more, more than just farm implement making and building buildings and whatnot, but you know, household items that that people wanted and and Deerfield is an example of a of a town that developed quite early and and um and had some fairly wealthy people amongst those folks because you can tell by the uh um the architecture, wonderful early houses um, and so that's that's where I begin um, my story really um, and and of course the churches were were very um, were very uh, instrumental um, in the uh, in the towns in the early towns um, of course, Deerfield is having their 350th anniversary this year, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that's what, let's see, 72, 16, 1672, I believe. 73. <laughs> uh huh. And interestingly enough, that was the year 1673 that um, the first church of Deerfield uh, was established. Um, and now presently, they have, they're in the brick, the, the brick church, um, as we call it, um, the meeting house is the fifth meeting house. That's the fifth, house, the fifth church building in Deerfield. That was built in 1824. So, um, Previously, the building, the previous uh, meeting house was uh, right just to the uh, to the south of um, on the street of the church in front of where the uh, Deerfield Academy building is, um, and that that burnt down. But interesting, interesting story is that 
the weather vane that presently sits atop um, the, the Deerfield Church at this point, um, uh, a weathercock or rooster weather vane, was uh, made in 1739. And so Jonathan Hoyt was, was to, given the job of going to Boston to buy this weather, buy a weather vane for the church. And, and we believe it was imported, English imported, although Shem Drown, who made the, the uh, weather vanes, um, Faneuil Hall weather vane, other church weather vanes was from Boston, but I don't think it's a Shem Drown. Um, I did, however, get the, uh, the opportunity to get up close and personal with, uh, with that uh, weather vane. And um, last, what was that, a 06, I think it was, when they were, that doesn't seem possible, but anyway, when they built the um, staging to redo the, the, uh, the whole steeple structure, um, rotted pieces of wood and whatnot, that was a time to bring down the, the, uh, the weather vane. It needed, it, it, there was lots of damaged parts to it, and so... Um, so I, I got the uh, opportunity to walk up this rickety uh, staging up 120 feet or so. It, it's like uh, sc very scary but very exhilarating at the same time. Um, and, bring this, and bring this weather vane down. We hoisted it. It's all on film, by the way. A friend of mine was following me around which is, uh, I've got that on my website, but regardless, and we'd hoist down these pieces, the big huge ball that was all crushed, and then there was a diamond piece, and then the weather vane, and take a rope and lower it down and, and bring it to my shop where I, this is, this is, uh, yeah, this hadn't even been worked on yet. Uh, be, um, so there was a lot of, soldering joints that came loose. There were some bullet holes in there, by the way. So they, no one wants to touch bullet holes on old weather vanes. That's really a history thing. I mean, I, you, of course, who was that? Was that the Deerfield Academy boys, you know? Well, I don't know. But there was a, two or three bullet holes in it, so somebody won the prize. Um, so I worked on it in my shop and, uh, and uh, straightened out things, knocked out dents, soldered it back together, then brought it to a woman um, in New Hampshire who was a gilder. And she was kind of old world woman and she, she used a squirrel, um, uh, what was it, a, a squirrel brush. It was kind of like, I, I forget how, yeah, that's, that's what it was. And she would do, she'd do it with the hair and then she'd put on the, 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 uh, the gilding. It's remarkable. Then we, then we um, proceeded to, then they came to uh, take this precious thing and walk it up. I walked it up. You know, this time I couldn't hold on to the railings, you know, and all the way up to the top and put the... Uh, the weather vane back in place. Uh, that's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to make a, re, uh, a replica, um, although I later did uh, for someone else, but they didn't want to replace it with a replica. So here it is 284 years later and it's still looking down on Deerfield. So if, when you go through Deerfield and look up at the brick church it, that is one piece of history, I'll tell you. And it's what it's seen, who knows. Um, and so the, um, the, the, uh, the, going back to the church, Paul Revere, his name I'll, I'll allude to, 
a few more times. But he, he made several pieces of uh, a silver tankard, a silver cup, um, in 1763 um, for the first church. They had a lot of sur uh, church silver, very important, you know, part of the service, um, which later uh, was acquired when they decided with much controversy, apparently, which it often is, to sell the church silver um, and, and do good with the money. Uh, Deerfield ended up with it, thankfully, so it was already on display there anyway, and so it's still there in this Deerfield silver shop. Um, and so, and the silver shop, incidentally, is, um, is named, so this is where the lineage begins um, the first silversmith um, in Franklin County, basically, was Isaac Parker, who uh, built a shop on Albany Road in uh, Old Deerfield, which is the road off to the right where most of Old Deerfield building, I mean Deerfield Academy buildings are. So he built a shop there uh, from the 1770s to 1788. He was there. Um, and uh, he took on an apprentice named John Russell. So, and, and, and this is, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of John Russells, because John Russell, the, silver, the apprentice silversmith in the 1780s, his father lived in, in Deerfield. Uh, John Russell, he was a tailor, and and his mother was a Sheldon, um, so there was some, by Taylor, I mean, you know, Taylor, a, Taylor with an I. Um, and, uh, and so, so he, he, uh, he was an apprentice, John Russell, to, um, to Isaac Parker. And so to this day, they call um, the, the re- uh, what do you? What do we want to say? A reincarnation of a colonial silver shop, which Deerfield has. Um, it's just like I get a, a many opportunities through the years to put on my Paul Revere shirt and um, and and go into this setting. I actually will show you pictures of it shortly. John Russell um, is one of the names of that part. Um, silversmith shop, the Parker Russell silversmith shop. Um, and so, let's see, uh, X out. Thing. This, this is, these are just pictures of John Russell's spoons. So, there's very little of his silver that is um, um, known, but uh, Deerfield owns some of his uh, work, um, and and spoons was one of the things he was he he was involved with. Um, and th here, this is w an inside with one of the views of the inside of the of the shop, much as it looks today. They moved the uh, silversmith's bench off to the left um, of this picture now um, to make room for a, a draw bench. But the flints were collectors of silver who developed the flints who, who made, um, who helped along with Boyden, the, the uh, Deerfield Academy headmaster. Um, in the starting in the, around 1960, actually, late 50s, started Old Deerfield, you know, to re re renovate and buy up old historic properties and turn it into the museum village that it, that it is today. Um, and Henry Flint was particularly interested in silver, amongst other things. He, he had a, a, a fabulous collection of silver. Um, and in, in addition to collecting silver, 
it was a, a mission of his and his wife's to actually create a, a colonial silversmith shop that would be um, very accurate in, in its tooling and in, in every way. It really is. Every time I go in there, um, once or twice a year, twice a year usually, to do a, a program, it feels like Paul Revere just walked out the back door kind of thing, you know. Um, it's, it's magical in my, in my mind. And so they did a fabulous job of, um, of, of recreating this silversmith shop and then manning it so that people who came from about the early 60s on, they could go to the silversmith shop and every day there was a silversmith working, you know, making things and whatnot. So um, it's one of my my favorite uh, things and along the lines the building they put this silversmith shop in was um, uh, 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 just a moved building but this is a this is a uh, silversmith actual silversmith shop from the 17 mid 1700s in of all places Southampton Long Island Elias Pelletro so this is this is we have only a couple of places um, that um, exist that where they were actually doing their work. This is another. This is in Norwich, Connecticut, uh, right in the center of town as well. Um, Joseph Carpenter. They call it the Carpenter Silversmith Shop. So they, they'd like to change his name, but no, that's not going to happen. Um, and so, so um, just we're also talking about other people who came to this area. Richard Lee came as a pewterer. There was two pewterers that came about the same time in the 1790s. And um, um, one of them was Richard Lee. He came to Ashfield, of all places. Um, we still can't figure out where. It's my hometown. I did a lot of research, but... Um, his autobiography didn't, all he wanted to talk about was, you, you know, fire and brimstone and stuff like that, and no answers about where he lived in town and whatnot. But nevertheless, he, he, he came from Taunton and spent uh, three years, 1791 and 94, in Ashfield, and then moved up the river to Springfield, Vermont, with his son, and who then became um, a, uh, a um, well-known and well-collected uh, brass uh, maker. But this is Richard Lee uh, Sr.'s, um, one of his specialties was these small little porringers, you know, about two and a half inches or so. And this is from the Ashfield Historical Society collection. Um, and so uh, there, there was Richard Lee. The other one was Samuel Pierce, and that's where that has a direct connection because of Greenfield. Samuel Pierce um, was a, uh, um, a, a highly regarded uh, pewter from Middletown, Connecticut, who moved to Greenfield in 1792. Um, and among the other things he did was he ran a general store he actually was a, a dealer in metal, um, and with his, with his son John, he opened up a store, John Pierce, who eventually bought, built a foundry just this side of the building here. So that was the very first foundry uh, after the, after the, the building, um, the mills that were here, the original building here. And um, according to the, uh, the, it's a wonderful book, Conservative Rebel by, I forget his name, about the, green, the history of Greenfield, um, there was a six-story building here on this site, six stories. It's like, a, uh, a, you know, it had different kinds of um, mill-type facilities or something on it. 
Um, anyway, John Pierce, um, Samuel Pierce's son, um, built a foundry just, just uh, um, this side of this, this building. Um, um, and of course, other things that were going on um, in the hill towns were uh, in the 1830s at this point. Um, Lampson, Silas Lampson started the Lampson and Goodnow in Shelburne Falls. Um, Lyman Kendall um, was in the, doing the textile thing in Coleraine. And, you know, uh, uh, clearly that's where Kendall Mills um, comes from. Uh, actually, so what I'm going to talk about now is um, um, the, uh, the uh, moving on to later 1800s, we have Chauncey Wing, who was, um, um, he established a foundry across from Wiley and Russell. Um, and I guess I should mention that John Russell, the, the apprentice to Isaac Parker, the silversmith, it was his son who, who became the, uh, the man who um, brought about all the, the various Russell, Wiley and Russell, Russell Cutlery, Chisel Factory initially. Um, and so, um, so that, that was that, that lineage. But Chauncey Wing um, um, from Greenfield in, 18, in the 1870s, he was a pattern maker, a, an inventor, all sorts of things. Um, and he built a foundry across from Wiley and Russell, the Wiley and Russell um, uh, uh, cutlery shop, um, factory. And, um, and then Chauncey Ring, Wing moved his foundry from Mead Street here to Pierce Street. So, so obviously Samuel Pierce and John Pierce had something to do with with the naming of, it seems obvious to me anyway, Pierce Street. Um, and uh, regardless, uh, Chauncey Wing built a little shop right on Pierce Street, um, which where they made all kinds of things like tele, tele, typewriter mechanisms and all kinds of interesting things in their small building, which is still there to this day. Um, uh, at the at the west end of of Pierce Street, just before you come to Davis or whatever that is, um, and and this connects now to me because when I was uh, just moving back to this area, I we we got an apartment. With, uh, my wife and son, young young son, he's now fifty. Um, as of <laughs> two days ago, um, we, we had an apartment right across from the wing, um, little factory there. And so I got to meet Henry Wing. Um, he was, I was 21 or something, 22. And I don't know how old he was, but there, he, um, Hmm. Well, I guess I, we missed a couple of images here. Oh, at any rate, so, so uh, Chauncey Wing, um, it, so Henry Wing, actually, going to, right to the pre present day, or the 70s was not exactly present day, but he, he was an inventor too, and he, he, he made this little race car um, looked like one of these things from the early Indianapolis 500, um, one, of the, one of the earliest ones. Um, but Greenfield also has this heritage, and this is where we move on to Luntz, um, uh, where A.F. Toll, um, who apprenticed 
to the Moltons out in Newburyport, moved to Greenfield and opened up the, uh, and built the, 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 what's now the Luntz building, but it was the AF Toll building. And they made silver there. And um, in around 1900, they, they failed in uh, George Lunt, um, who, um, who was uh, uh, from the Rogers, and Lunt, and Bolin, which is what it, it was before Lunt Silversmith. It was Rogers, Lunt, and Bolin. So this wasn't on the river, of course, but this is early industry of, of, um, of Greenfield. Um, so George um, became the first of the, of the generations of Lunt's um, to, uh, to, to make silver, um, well, fine, fine silver for sure. Um, and that was an interesting place to visit. Um, I did a, uh, uh, we did a film there um, with the metal curator from Winter Tour um, going through and looking at all these early machines, you know, drop hammers and all kinds of things going down into the, the cavernous basement where they had stacks and stacks of dyes and things, you know, covered in dust. And it, it was really a, a, a wonderful thing to see. Um, and um, so, and so I worked with Luntz on a few projects here and there. And, um, and the final part of that story is that I worked with the engraver and designer, uh, Cedric Bannister, um, a wonderful gentleman, Irish brogue and all, whoever might know him, um, who was a master hand engraver. And so his hand is on um, many things that I've made, presentation, silver pieces from um, uh, near and far. Um, I've got one example uh, here, um, but that is that is sort of the end of my story about the lineage of uh, how you know the John Russell in particular, Samuel Pierce, um, some of these early early um, makers, tradesmen, craftsmen, artisans, if you will. Um, Really, it, it was their sons who kept the thing going and helped helped to develop the uh, the the great uh, metalworking, cutlery, uh, tool and die making industries of this area. And um, so it's 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 really interesting to to learn how that. And I I did with in my research, I kept finding more and more little tidbits about how they were connected, how it's all interconnected. And it's quite interesting to, to connect those dots. Um, but what I, what I thought I would do is um, show you a few of the things that I've um, made and been involved with uh, before I um, do a, a brief little demonstration here. Uh, so going back to the Deerfield Church, this is the triple tier church, uh, chandelier, which is in the um, uh, in the church in Deerfield. Um, if you've not been in it, it's just a, the classic um, dear, uh, early early church with the uh, box and pews, huge huge pulpit. You know, if you have to walk up a set of stairs to get to the top, so that the so that the guy could look down on the people there, and look sort of straight over to the people on the on the balcony, um, beautiful balcony all the way around, um, with a big dome top, and so the the um, they were looking to replace the uh, the small. Um, somewhat inappropriate Italian-styled um, weather, uh, I mean, chandelier, 
not weather vane, chandelier um, with something that might fit better. And so I was very fortunate to have been asked to, to hammer. We hammered this up. It's all hand hammered. It wasn't spun. Um, the ball, as, as I'm going to show, starts with a big disc, slightly hammered um, into a bowl, raised up using all these different hammers till you made out of a flat sheet a half ball. And then you had to do it again and then make sure that they, this one was the same size as that one. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, it's all completely hand hammered thanks to my, my son who worked with me for many years. Um, and he still comes in once in a while. Um, but he, he, his hand is certainly in this. And also uh, a, another friend of mine who worked with me back when I was doing shows and um, a few shows down in Pennsylvania and and book parts, other museum shows and such. And we'd get orders, what was that in the 90s? And things were really popping back then, as they say. So we had a lot of things to do. And I had, I had three people, or two people, and myself. So it was a mini factory. <laughs> but anyway, he, that, that is always a very great satisfaction to go see the uh, to go into that setting and see our chandelier, you know, hanging there. And of course, after that was the weather vane, so we kind of have uh, um, some connection to that, to that Deerfield Church, for sure. <clears throat> okay, come on. There we go. This is a this is a um, an ornament for a Christmas tree, the White House Christmas tree, the Blue Room Christmas tree. Um, when uh, Hillary Clinton was uh, first lady, she I guess it was ninety nine or something like that. She um, reached out to a number of artisans around the country to um, make something to go on this Christmas tree um, uh, from d all different kinds of artisans, you know. And I was the, I was the silversmith of the group. Um, and, you know, it just had to be historical in nature. So I thought, well, Massachusetts, silver, it's got to be Paul Revere. And so I... I hammered up this um, using chasing tools and pitch, uh, drawing this image and hammering it a little bit from the front and back until we got this image of Paul Revere on his horse with the North Church in the background. It was about this big. There's a big piece of silver, which I thought, man, this is a heavy... Uh, uh, ornament but but the tree was huge and they had these minimum you, whatever you made you know with wood or or ceramic or whatever it had to be big enough cuz when when you saw the tree it's like where is it anyway um how long would it take to do that this one uh well uh you know that was much more of an artistic thing and I would say well, probably 25, 30 hours anyway. You know, um, you, you, you use pitch in order to do that kind of detail. Um, um, that's not the one I wanted to bring. But, but anyway, to get all this sort of um, relief of hammered, you know, repasse, they call it, um, Sometimes it's grapes and leaves. Sometimes it depends. It's a lot of different things. Um, whatever you can imagine, you can make with hammers and, and punches or chasing tools, as they're called. It's just a variety of all kinds of shapes and 
circles and domes and lines and and whatever and you you just gradually sort of paint with a hammer so to speak um and um yeah i would say probably all of 30 hours i don't know and of course it was donated um so i've always wondered where that ended up <laughs> supposed to be going to the clinton um library I assume it's there unless somebody else took a liking to it. <laughs> Hopefully it's being appreciated somewhere. But it was a, obviously a, a, a great honor anyway. Um, this was another exciting project. This, this is a replica of a, of a peace pipe that was cre uh, made in 1814 to come, um, which was when the second Greenville Treaty was signed. And that was where the, um, uh, the American government and William Henry Harrison, who was a, a, a general on the front lines of the War of 1812, fought the, the um, English um, and the Native American tribes, they had to pick which side they were, who, who, who did they believe, what it came down to, who did they believe, and some, some of the tribes, um, you know, fought with the Americans, and, um, and the chiefs of those tribes each got a peace pipe, the Delaware, the Shawnee, um, hmm. All right, it escapes me, but there was, there was uh, three or four um, given out. Of course, if you chose the British, you got a different um, prize, <laughs> unfortunately. Anyway, um, so they asked me to recreate um, the Shawnee pipe, and it's very interesting, beautiful, beautiful design. It's obviously not like a a Native American peace pipe. They're usually quite simple and straight and, and stone or uh, um, uh, other uh, materials. But, um, but at any rate, it, it's, it's very much a Philadelphia type style. Uh, must have been, it was unmarked, so that's, um, no one knows to this day. This, this pipe is in the, um, in the Smithsonian interestingly enough. Um, and the man who commissioned it went down to the Smithsonian and made a full-scale drawing. They were perfectly happy, like a artist drawing with, with um, you know, dimensions and everything. And I had all the photos. And so we recreated this. And then, I, then the people at Greenville we're getting ready for the 200th anniversary of the signing of the, uh, of, of the Greenville Treaty. So they got in touch with me and asked me to make a replica of the Shawnee pipe. This was at the Shawnee Prairie um, Preserve in Greenville. And so I went, they, they, sent, they got me there, flew me out there with the pipe and went to the ceremony and actually, I think I have a picture. I do. Well, this is on the four sides of that urn. Is this is the, this is what was hand engraved. And so, talking about Cedric Bannister from Luntz, who's still um, alive and living in Turner's Falls, he did this very. Uh, this is his work, and that's exactly. You know, even even though the uh, the two figures they're a little bit funky here, they're kind of he he copied everything exactly the way the original was, and the and the and the script, and you can see it, it was a peace and friendship thing, um, which was the that was the original intent in 1814. It kind of went awry, obviously. But for the, in 2014, all these, all these chiefs from all these various tribes came to Greenville 
uh, for a ceremony on the site. It's still a park where they, um, where the Greenville Treaty was signed, and uh, under this uh, this sort of gazebo thing that was recreated, they they kind of recreated the whole thing with a guy dressed as William Henry Harrison. You can see, and um, and th these these native folks came from all over the place in full dress and and um, they they kind of took me in as if I was one of them. Um, at some, uh, I got uh, some wampum and some wonderful little gifts, you know, and when they all got together afterwards, it was a wonderful experience. Um, then uh, other things, you know the purpose of this piece, somebody does, I'm sure. It's a creamer. It's a cow. It's a cow creamer um, that uh, was featured in, in uh, one of P. J. Woodhouse's um, um, British comedy um, episodes, and it was a big joke in the, amongst the family. This was a very classic English uh, London form in the 1750s and 60s, and um, the, the family made fun of it because you you know, uh, for different reasons, but you pick up the tail as the handle, you can see the uh, little um, uh, lidded hinge, hinged lid rather, with a bird on it, but the originals had a fly of all things. <laughs> it's like, they all did, you know, the one at the Clark, which is the one I copied, um, the, it had a fly, they all, all the ones you, that remain. So I guess it was just a matter of fact, flies and cows, you know. <laughs> Little did they know, apparently. Is this one yours? Yeah. Yeah, I made it on commission. And I, we decided, you know, to go with... Actually, I looked across the street, and we had cows across the street, and there was a bird on the cow. <laughs> and I, it's like this a eureka-type moment. Bird. Yeah. And so I sculpted the little bird, and... Uh, this is a hint. This is made just like a weather vane, and two halves soldered all the way around the perimeter, and then they they cast feet, forged tail and horns, and chased or you know detailing for the eyes, and a little hinged lid. Um, and this is. May I ask what the color, how you color it? How did I what? You got dark on there. That was just, just from the, um, uh, yeah, that was just reflections. It looks like a, what, what a black and white is Holstein. Holstein. I, I knew, I knew with somebody. <laughs> so here I am chasing some of the decoration. This is set in, one half is set in pitch. And, um, you know, um, so what the pitch does, you can either fill fill a vessel with this, it's like hot tar, and it hardens, or you can just set the piece in. Um, but what it does is, once it hardens, it it um, supports the the metal everywhere, but but the exact um, shape of your tool, whatever it is, and it and it gives there, but everywhere else it holds it, so you can. Instead of like uh, hammering it and you get a, like a dent in the car door, it's like, you know, details you can put in really, you know, very, very fine floral details or grapes and leaves or whatever. And this is my last photo of a tea set I made so, some years ago. I made two or three of them. What um, is that? What age would that have been historically? Well... Interesting question. They never, they, there was never a set like that because the, they, they never did. I don't understand why. The, the apple shape, or, or sometimes they call it bullet shape, um, raised up was such a difficult thing to do that I think they only made them around for 10 or 15 years. 
similar to the cow creamer. I think they, people decided, you know, this is a lot. Even for these guys that spend, you know, countless hours doing their thing, that's my theory because it is a beautiful shape. So I made the, the, these, the teapot, the apple teapot. There are quite a few examples, American and English, more, more American, <laughs> and the lighthouse coffee pot, but they never really went together. And they didn't even start making tea sets until like 1780s, 90s. Before that, it was individual pieces. So I got to design this set and sort of, you know, make the, the creamer like the lighthouse coffee pot and the, and the uh, sugar to be a replica of the, of the teapot. So that was, that's my own interpretation, sort of like the chandelier too, of classic um, style, which when, when you restore antiques, you get, to, you get to learn. It's almost like you're, in a way, an apprentice to the makers, these early makers, because you can, you get to handle it and look at the inside and see how they put it together and and sort of figure it out and learn that. How long did that take you? Oh God, the teapot. <laughs> yeah, the teapot was a hundred hours at least. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the full set was easily two hundred hours. Yeah, yeah. Do you have it still? No, well, this, this set was for a guy in Amherst, the same guy with the cow creamer, um, professor at Amherst College. It's now down in Naples, Florida. Uh, that I, I made a set, a copy of this set uh, that's in um, Allentown, Pennsylvania. What's that? Uh, I've heard that name, but, yeah, but at any rate, um, yeah, and there's a hand-carved handle, so I don't know how much time I have. Okay, lose track of time completely, but, sure, anyone have a question? Um, well, the silver came from different sources. Most, most of the time it came from um, the people who were commissioning the work. And they brought um, either Spanish coins or they brought, they brought um, older pieces, earlier pieces that were either damaged or God forbid, out of style, <laughs> you know. Oh, this is this is so Rococo. This now federal period, you know. Anyway, they would melt down, and they would have a little stock of the, of silver. But most of the time, they were, the, the silver was was really the wealth of of these people was in the material itself. So it wasn't like from ore, like a foundry had to smelt the ore out. Of Right, the foundries were were the the Spanish mines and uh, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, well, not so much. I mean, there was mines everywhere, but you know where there's uh, uh, silver veins. You know, is is where the silver throughout history came from until you know until the industrial age and bigger factories and processing and other than that it was smeltering smelting you know around a hot coal fire and a you know and and purifying um uh the uh, the silver separating the silver from the ore and and lead and whatnot that so comes it's with it it's yeah. totally recycled the silver silver all metalsmiths really are the original recyclers I mean, going back to 5,000 B.C. when the people started pulling, you know, ore out of the ground and saying, hmm, if we put that in a fire and then this stuff melts away and we get this thing and if you mess with it, it, it can start to make something. And so the, um, the, uh, the common thing was to make something and then say, ah, I don't like this and throw it in the fire 
And so to this day, just like Paul Revere would melt down uh, some masterpiece, <laughs> unfortunately, that was just too old and boring, um, people have always been recycling um, and, and fashioning new things, casting it into something or making ingots out of it that you hammer into sheet and now roll now rolling mills into sheet uh, and rolling mills starting in 1770s or 80s or something like that um, in England um, most technology started came from the old countries um, uh, in the 18th century for sure um, even though us Americans were starting to figure out things and invent things and and uh, come up with our own ideas. At first it was, you know, England in, in particular, they just wanted our raw materials and they didn't, and then wanted to make something and sell it back to us. That was kind of the way things went, you know, um, in, the, in the most of the 18th century. Um, but the, another thing about the recycling, which always fascinates me, I buy my silver from a, a, a company in New Mexico, um, a, a refinery processor, you know, sheets and wires and all sorts of forms, and um, and it's been and it's been melted down. So when I get a new sheet of silver, who's to say where some of those molecules have been? Maybe in some Egyptian princess's bracelet or something, or a Paul Revere piece, or who's who's who knows? It's a it's a mix of all these, you know, molecules of silver that all come together in the sheet. So it's kind of kind of fascinating. Plus, the thing about silver too is that it's like like all metals, iron, all the all the metals. Um, they came from long ago and far, far away. To pardon my the, uh, borrowing a phrase, but you know the um, uh, supernovas that, that get you know spread throughout the the universe and and then gather up in in Earth and the, all the forces of heat and everything um, create new new. Uh, um, uh, elements and all of that so it's pretty cosmic material actually so there's that <laughs> yes I do that's my one uh, venture into the world of uh, um, uh, wood making so this is a piece of walnut that I've first made the this is this is going on this replica of Paul Revere um, fluted teapot and so this came from a uh, three-quarter inch thick piece of walnut sawn out and then I just take rifflers and it's just sculpting so it's I don't have, need to be an advanced um, uh, uh, cabinet maker or something to make these it's just remove Remove it until there's nothing. You're done taking this, taking it away, and it that's gets the shape. Said. Exactly. <laughs> you got to get rid of everything that shouldn't be there. Just smooth it out after. Yeah. Um, and so that's this is a project that I'm working on right now, which is um, which is quite interesting. Um, this man who uh, um, he now has dementia, but he, for years, he would go and, and work on and make, go out to uh, programs and make things um, and a week-long thing, jewelry, wonderful things. So he decided he wanted to make a, a replica of the Paul Revere teapot, you know, fluted teapot. Um, and um, like this, this is, this is a lunch piece. Sure. This one or the other one? This one is, th this one is, this is Luntz, um, version of a Paul Revere um, 
uh, coffee pot. Actually, they 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 made it taller to be a coffee pot. Yeah, and this isn't even wood. That's uh, composite material. Um, so yeah, it's going to look quite like that, except for I think the proportions are a little nicer on the lower the teapot. Um, so that's anyway. So this this guy never finished his. He got started on this and started to flute it, and then he wasn't able to to take these classes anymore. So his wife fairly recently came to me and with the few parts that he had already started and asked if I could finish it. And it's like, well, sure. I've always wanted to make that teapot, and I never figured at this point in my career I probably would, although you never know. Depends what the next person asks for. But um, um, so, yeah, that's, that's next in line to finish that up. And what I'm, the, the, what I'm going to be doing here is um, this is a this is a case where I'm going to uh, this has been roughly roughly shaped, but there's a lot of you know dents and and whatnot in here, so it now needs to be smoothed out by hammer, which is called planishing. And so I'm going to, uh, I think I will take that chair. Here's a request if whenever possible you can hold things up. Those of course, things. yeah, sure. I don't, I don't know if, I'm just going to hammer this here. I, this I'm not going to probably lift up, but um, everything else I will, but it's just a sort of a repetitious, it's all very repetitious. It's a lot of hammer blows. Um, if you count them, the mathematician that I am, I, I've done that math. Let's see, it was my average... You know, minute is is fifty fifty five, you know, blows, and I just did this for an hour. So right there, I've three thousand or something, and I did it for ten hours or twenty hours, or you know, to to do some of these larger things. You have carpal tunnel syndrome. I I I learned when not to uh, when to draw the line and stop. I learned on this pod actually. <laughs> Because it was, I, I, yeah, I didn't know. I think, I, I know it's been done. I can, I can do this. And it's starting to come around. And then it's getting steeper. And then you start necking it in. And it's like it wants to crack. And it's like, I got to keep going here. Because I don't, you know, I'm not going to sleep if I, if, this, if I don't finish this. And I kept going and going two days in a row. And suddenly it's like. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's the uh, yeah. Do you, do you uh, sign your pieces? Do you stamp them? Uh huh. And is it uh, particular? We were lucky enough to get a salver uh, for our, for our wedding. Yeah. And so it sort of set me on this treasure hunt of learning what each of the stamps mean on the back of the piece. Yeah. Do you do you do that? Yeah, the hallmark. Do you have uh, certain stamps that you use? Yes. That and, and if so, can you explain that a little bit more? Right. I mean, you know, hallmarks or touch marks, they're just, they're, they're individually made stamps with whether it's your initials or in my case, I have, they say Smithers, um, you know, in the 18th century, early American silver and English tended to be just initials. And then in right around, you know, uh, 1800 or so, somewhere around that turn of the century, they started putting their whole name like Revere was one of the first to do that in the late 1700s. So those, you know, it's just, that's the end of the, the line, and then you carefully punch it and try and 
get the whole impression and sometimes it it's not quite straight and it's like well I can't see the last S and <laughs> then you got to try and put it right in the same little groove so you don't double stamp it and you know anyway that that can be an adventure in itself we, we went to an appraiser and it was an 18th century, 18th century piece and we looked it up in the book and it was just initials and the name of the silversmith was John Tweet which is British which, it was an English right right is that level of documentation does that still exist to this day where 100 years from now 200 years from now somebody can pick it up and say you made it I at least, at least in my case, yeah, they're all they're all Mark Smithers and and you some. Spell your name out. Yeah, it's it's so there's no there's no initials to say hmm, you know, um, uh, and there's not a lot of makers as opposed to the 18th century anyway, so it'll be a little easier somewhere down the line I guess to figure out, you know, um, who who did it, but. Sometimes you see pieces, early pieces, hand hand wrought pieces, that aren't um, marked, and it's like, what were you thinking? How come you <laughs> like the peace pipe? You know, I mean, but I guess that that was probably a, a political thing. Yes, but those marks were marked. Yes. Yeah, but those marks were a tool, like your chasing tools. It's a, piece. It's a punch. It's a, it's a steel so where... That's a different skill. Maybe nobody was around to make one. Well, they had tool and die makers, you know, so you, 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 you had that too, right. you know, just like you had blacksmiths to, to forge these, these tools, you know, to, to the anvils and everything like that. I've got all kinds of anvils, they're, they're different kinds of shapes. I have about 80 hammers. Um, some many of which were given to me through the years, you know, um, at a show or something. Oh my! I used to do silversmithing, or my father or something. And up in the attic, we got uh, a bunch of uh, tools. And there's hammers and anvils and little hand tools. It's wow. Steve, can I follow up on that question? Sure. In fact, in this building, this was they made steel stamps, and some most of it was letters and numbers but if you wanted your logo made you know this would have come here some i just yeah drawn up somebody would draw up the artwork and there was a whole we're still investigating how it was done some of it is just incredible but uh -huh. yeah there were there were companies specializing in that i had stamps. a yeah i had a guy made my first one raymond george um from montague he was a tool and die maker and it's it's like wow! It's this beautiful little uh, Smithers stamp. I don't know. I brought up only a few of the things. Yeah, there's his, there's his stamp. Um, uh huh. Smithers. And then uh, talking about Cedric Bannister, the engraver. I mean, this is the first tankard I ever made. Hollow handle, really a tricky thing to do. Um, Anyway, I made this, and one day Cedric, was, who did the peace pipe and all the other stuff, he says, why don't I engrave your coat of arms on, on this for you? It's like, sure, okay. And he researched the Smithers coat of arms, and it's just, it's just gorgeous what he did. You know, it's, it's just so, so masterful, all hand engraved. And then he put a monogram, fancy... SPS on the on the back and so now it's really a family piece and uh, <laughs> that'll be up to my grandson or later yeah now tell me um, do you suppose that some of them weren't stamped because they thought they would never go away uh, you know go out of the family or go anywhere possible I you know lots of times you end up wondering what's the story here yeah. you know why did they not stamp it how did this damage happen that's a little yeah. hard to imagine you know I mean it's 
in the lifetime of, of use, you can tell things that were used a lot because they often have lots of dents and like this piece, um, um, which I'm going to be attending to at some point. Um, here's a, this is a, this is a, um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this building, but if you think UMass, it's the old chapel. So I, I was asked to make a, uh, a silver chapel about this big for Eugene Eisenberg, the, the School of Management guy. And so and he's now gone, but at the commencement, they, they presented him with this silver version of the, of the um, yeah, and I've done many other, I've done the Deerfield Church as a presentation piece. St. John's in, in Richmond, Virginia, the give me liberty or give me death speech guy. What's it? <laughs> what was this? Yeah, you know, I mean, Nathan, Nathan Hale. Yeah. Anyway, I've, you look, I took pictures and then kind of used my mathematical skills. So I eventually used that math from Northeastern eventually. <laughs> I, I guess everyone else ended up probably in, you know, the Bill Gates of the world in my class, but no, I, I, was too, I was too busy doing, going to hear music. And, what, what is that right in the back? Uh, uh, this. Yeah. This is a, a caster. Um, it's, a, it's, it's for spices. Um, and these were, these were popular in the 1800s. Um, 1700s rather, um, into the 1800s, and they used it the, for mustard and um, pepper and sugar. Yeah, and, and these were very, very expensive commodities coming over, you know, from the Caribbean and wherever. Um, so, you know, the teas and those spices were often under lock and key. But these would come in sets of three. And these early ones were chisel pierced before they, before they invented the, um, the jeweler's saw, um, which, which um, you need to get the right kind of steel so these teeny little bra blades wouldn't break so much. Before that, they would actually chisel out all these fine details. Um, and the sets of three were sugar, sugar, uh, mustard, mustard, and pepper. Yeah. Steve, we've got about five minutes. We've got about five minutes before we're going to switch gears. If there's any more final questions, yeah, for Steve. And sure. then we're going to take about a ten-minute little break, switch gears, go into our hand tool. And I'm and I'm going to be here slowly packing up. So I think Mark can, I don't know, you're going to use either of these I'm tables. going to use both of those tables. Okay then. That's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs>